Welcome to Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth and love ministry podcast designed to help biblical Christians witness to their Mormon friends, family, and missionaries. For more Bible-based resources, check out tilm.org. We have all kinds of resources to support you, including classes, witnessing scenarios, books, and so much more. Visit tilm.org today. Welcome to Witnessing Christ from the New Testament. This is Molly. This is John. This week we are studying Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. John, please give us an overview of what we're studying today. So this is an account of Jesus' passion, his trial before Pilate, and his crucifixion. We're going to take a look at the importance of seeing who Jesus is as we read this section. So it's really important what lens you have as you apply it. Uh, We'll not only listen to what's said, but there's different circumstances, different things that are happening that help tell the story. Throughout this section, we're going to focus not only on the what, what is happening, but but why? What's the significance for us? We'll want to draw that out for our friends, as well as... um, specific encouragements to share with your LDS friends. In some ways, I feel like this week is like the, the culmination of everything we're pointing towards. You know, here is Jesus paying for the sins of the whole world, paying for my sins, and I'm, I'm almost intimidated, like I've, I've got to get it right. And um, <laughs> some, some of my intimidation about witnessing this week comes from not fully understanding the LDS view of the cross. I understand that it is not as important to them. They diminish it. But when it comes to their explanation of the atonement and why the atonement is not really the cross, I just get so confused. (laughs) So first, I just kind of want to ask you a bit more about how they view the cross in general. Um, and yeah, we'll go from there. So tell us about the LDS view of the cross. So you, you mentioned atonement. They don't see that necessarily happening here at Calvary, but more in Gethsemane and the shedding of blood as the sweat. And, and they will describe the atonement as making forgiveness possible. That word is always included. Uh, sometimes the way they word atonement is somewhat vague, um, and so different things are read into it, but it's always connected th- with that word possible. They will de-emphasize, as you mentioned, the cross, because they'll say, well, we want to focus more on a living Jesus than a, a dying one. Now, they will say that the cross was necessary so that Jesus then could, in turn, raise from the dead and provide victory over death for, for us and for all but um, they do not see the the fullness of everything that's happening here on Calvary in the same way a biblical Christian would. What's particularly striking to me, Molly, is when you have someone who leaves Mormonism and then discovers biblical Christianity, one of the things that's so common is you see them wearing like a cross necklace or something like that. Uh, it, it becomes so dear because they now look at this through a whole new lens. And whereas normally Calvary and the cross are de-emphasized, friends, this is an opportunity, perhaps like none other, because they will actually be studying this account this week. And so I really want to encourage you, if you've been on the fence about reaching out to your LDS friend, take that step this week to really have a conversation about what the c- happened and, more importantly, why it happened, mm-hmm. why it matters. I, I think that's really encouraging to stop and think about that in some ways they have never heard the message of the cross, not, not the message that you know from the Bible. And so maybe it doesn't matter that I deeply understand LDS theology, but here is my chance to proclaim the cross to them, like just witnesses just show them the Jesus you know help them see why Jesus did what he did we'll focus sometimes on some of the things that they will believe as they're coming at it but don't make that your focus just overflow 
with what you know to be true from this very pivotal section of scripture? So today we are not going to just read each chapter of the crucifixion. We're going to pick some topics that we think would be helpful to discuss with your LDS friends. And then we'll refer to the chapter and verse of those topics. So hopefully if these come up when you are witnessing, um, they will help you dive deeper and share why Jesus did what he did and who he truly is. Maybe one, before we jump in, would be uh, they will look at this section through the lens uh, in their curriculum of 1 Corinthians 13. So Jesus is showing love which of course he is, right? Show the full extent of his love. Um, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends, right? Uh, And they'll they'll pair it with uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter on love. So for example, he's not easily provoked, or he suffereth long, or um, he he seeketh not for himself, uh, from from the King James. These are things that they'll they'll say, see, this is what Jesus was doing, and they culminate in this statement. They say, he teaches us by showing us. So clearly, when a Mormon looks at this section of Scripture, they're going to look at it more from the perspective of Jesus is my example. We're going to want to change that set of lenses to see Jesus as substitute. And I might just start out mm-hmm. by saying, in the Old Testament, right? The, where does this fall in the context? All the Old Testament sacrifices were always substitutionary. That animal died, so you wouldn't have to. And yet they always pointed ahead to Jesus as a sacrifice. Make that connection to Jesus as a substitutionary sacrifice. John the Baptist, look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we'll see in, in other passages, Jesus as substitute. Give them that that set of lenses as we look study this section. Highlighting substitute, not just an example. Okay. So what are what's the first topic you'd like to dive into? I, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about Jesus as a king. We see this as a, a thread that's woven together in this section. And yet people use the term but don't always fully understand its meaning. Okay. So we have verses from the book of John. This is chapter 19, and this is the first couple of verses. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. And this is verse 19. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, Many of the Jews read this sign, and for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. John, you had mentioned uh, connecting to Old Testament, and this reminds me of when Samuel was uh, with the Israelites and they were saying, we demand a king. And Samuel was all upset, like, uh, oh, they don't like me. And God was saying, no, Samuel, they've rejected me as king. And now here again, we see Jesus, God, being rejected as king. An old theme played out again. Absolutely. Uh, they wanted Jesus or a king on their terms, which is why they missed him. And they missed the kind of king that he he came to be. Earlier, uh, John 18, Jesus has an exchange with Pilate, and he he says, yeah, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. Well, back in the Old Testament, that's what they wanted a king for, to be like all the other nations, right? Uh, In a sense, they're looking for the glory days of David, which is why they're waiting for this Messiah, a a grand earthly king, like a David 2.0. And and Jesus came in a far greater way. But if you you look with a limiting lens, you'll actually miss him. And I think sometimes people, even today, put Jesus in a box to say, you know, this is the, the, the genie Jesus or the, the miracle Jesus or the self-help Jesus or all of those things. And if you, if you put that preconceived uh, set of lenses on, you'll miss who he really is and the power of what he came to do. Maybe we even think about it um, 
you know, we talk about sometimes that we have a God size hole in our hearts that can only be filled with God or we try and fill it with false gods. We can also think of it as uh, who is sitting on the throne of your heart. And, uh, you know, it would be easy for me to confess what well, I keep trying to put myself on that throne. Like I prefer to receive honor and praise and glory for the things that I do. Um, I prefer to put myself first. And, you know, that would be one way that I am not putting Christ on the throne of my heart. Molly, I think that's a great way that we can be uh, vulnerable and, and talk about that hole in our heart uh, to say who is on the throne. Uh, so often in LDS theology, uh, ultimately, there's a focus on how well you're doing in the LDS plan of salvation. And so, in a sense, everything centers around you. If you give the perspective of what does it mean that Jesus is king, why does that matter? Help emphasize how that lifts him up in a whole new way. But then it also has the effect of lowering ourselves. When, when we emphasize Jesus as king, it's going to be kind of a, a unique dynamic because our LDS friends don't commonly talk about Jesus in those terms. Uh, one of the things I think is so startling, whereas the, the Roman soldiers here were calling him king but really didn't think of him that way. They were mocking him. Uh, they had a different king in their hearts, uh, in their thoughts, which was the emperor over in Rome. But after everything happens in this sequence of events, we see that the centurion says, surely this man was the son of God. That was a term, actually, back at that time that the Roman emperor had selected for himself. It was a title of a king. And what happened in that moment the, the centurion is essentially saying, this man who just died before me is my king, not that other guy over in Rome, which I think is, is particularly startling uh, and gives us perspective as we emphasize this theme of Jesus as king. Okay. So anything else we should highlight in general with Jesus as king? When he is in control, it means we let go but then it just comes with all the blessing of protection, resting in his power, just trusting in him. Um, and, and because you know the king and he knows you, you know royalty. And he actually makes you royalty, right? Royal priesthood. And so uh, there's just such beautiful pictures to pull out of this section of what does it mean Jesus is king and I know him, and he knows me. So overall, just that elevating of Jesus. You know, LDS diminish who he is. He is. We want to keep elevating who he is. Focus on his sovereignty. So the next area we discussed was looking at um, the, the death of Jesus and the gravity of sin. So the verses we highlight are highlighting here. So Matthew 27, and this is verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Oh, I'm going to not get this right. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. How was that? That was great. Okay. <laughs> um, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay. Uh, yeah, just started off. How, how does this highlight the gravity of sin, John? In our witness, so often we want to focus on uh, what Jesus has done for us. But before we can get to that, sometimes we have to focus on why it was necessary. And this shows really the, the depths of what, what's going on. So when you're talking about sin with our LDS friends, first of all, you have to talk about it's the serious nature of sin. Uh, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. So it's talking about eternal there. That actually has a shadow of what he means by wages of sin is death. It's really eternal death. It's not just physical death. And that's echoed throughout in other sections of Scripture. Uh, so often, I think maybe people in general and maybe our, our LDS friends in particular will think about the consequence of sin more in terms of that physical death. And here we want to emphasize no, this is separation from God, which is the way we would describe hell itself. That then helps give some shadow to what's happening here when Jesus says to his father, 
Why have you forsaken me? We know the picture of darkness is, is playing in as well at this time, but Jesus is literally suffering the depths of hell itself. So if we only think of Jesus' suffering as the scourging and the cross and, oh my, all that was involved with that, but we would miss the real bitter depths of what he's suffering for us because the Father has now turned his back on Jesus so that he would never turn his back on us. So do when LDS see this statement, do they understand that Jesus is paying for sin? They will understand the concept of Jesus uh, being separated from his father and he is suffering alone so that you won't have to. But it's, it's more f- from the perspective of sympathizing and God now will be with you in your trials. It's not this understanding of he's as our substitute paying for hell so that we won't have to. Okay, well, and just to see how creation is testifying to this, you know, it, that's weird that it's dark from noon till three in the afternoon. It does not get dark then unless something crazy is going on, a solar eclipse, or God is dying on the cross. Right. And, you know, just the fact that creation is, like, mourning alongside uh, Jesus as he's suffering hell. And um, I was thinking about hell and separation and how I don't, I don't always under- think my friends get that hell is being separate from God and you know because they have the other kingdoms that are separate from heavenly father you know to us well that's hell if you're not with God you're in hell right you're away from his presence and in particular his his blessing right and so hell can be only evil all the time Uh, I emphasize the serious nature of sin I I think of the hymn uh, for those who might be familiar uh, an old Uh, Lenten hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted, has a verse that says, If you think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great, here you see its nature rightly, here its guilt may estimate. Why did Jesus have to go to these depths of suffering? It exposes the depths of the problem that we couldn't fix. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say, show how prevalent sin is, uh, we often talk about James 2.10. You can keep the whole law, yet stumble at just one point, and then you're guilty of breaking all of it. So w- it's easy for someone to say, well, I, I didn't do this or that, but that passage says, yes, you did. And, and as a result, we deserve hell. There's no one who escapes, uh, no one who does good. We often talk about, um, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so it's really important to emphasize this is what we deserved, and that's why he's suffering it for us. So speaking of what we deserved, I think this also points to Barabbas and how he uh, he was the prisoner that deserved death, and Jesus died in place of him. Uh, Would this be a good area to highlight as well? Absolutely. I, I... I think about, do we really grasp? I mean, this guy was a, a infamous, can we use that term, a <laughs> terrorist. He was part of an insurrection, and it not only involved, um, you know, insurrection against Rome, but, you know, anyone who got in his way, he was a known murderer, and yet we see an exchange happening that is, is just powerful, it's clear the guilty one goes free and the innocent instead is punished. And Pilate himself, many times repeatedly, his wife, have nothing to do with that innocent man. Pilate says, I find no, no charge against him. Uh, that, that theme of innocence at the very same time is, is paralleled against Barabbas' clear guilt. And yet he's the one who goes free. Uh, that's, and it's just fascinating that that was coupled right in there in the crucifixion, the crucifixion story, just the innocent and the guilty and how we need to put ourselves in Barabbas' shoes and admit we are the sinner that deserves the death that Jesus got. And I, I think just to emphasize that, and, and that would almost be startling to identify with a, a murderer, 
But uh, Jesus said, hey, if you've ever hated, you're a murderer, right? So who has not at some point been guilty of that? And yet here you see the result. Uh, If you emphasize that you identify with Barabbas and that you go free because Jesus the innocent is punished for you, I think that would have a profound uh, impact and, and lead to great discussion with your LDS friends. Did you highlight 2 Corinthians 5 yet? I think that was a really good good verse. Yeah, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, to to be sin. He took on all of that which we deserve, all that filth and darkness, so that in him we might receive the, the perfection, right? The righteousness of God, the perfect life that Jesus lived is now then exchanged and given to us so that we are now set free there is now no condemnation it's so weird to call jesus sin it's that god made him who had no sin to be sin uh one of my bible teachers uh pointed out when jesus was on the cross he was the world's worst sinner which is just a shocking statement but in the sense that he was taking on every sin ever committed throughout history he is the world's worst sinner and the world's only sinner. The world's only sinner is right in, in the sense that he's, he's paying for the sin of the world, right? And, and the, all the fury and the wrath, I think, of, you know, there's pictures that try to, to give the imagery of, of this fire of God, that's wrath of God that's coming against Jesus, and we're on the other side, and he's protecting us from that, that he's taking it all for us in our place. So another section that would be very interesting to dive into is um, in forgiveness. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Um, I'm highlighting Luke. This is chapter 23, verse 32. I'll read it in context. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Okay, I always want to talk about forgiveness, but um, give give us some some depth of insight here in what our LDS friends might be thinking about this section. Remember, again, they're going to look at this as Jesus is our example, so he's forgiving people who may be they would say didn't deserve it, so we should also be forgiving like him. It's not so much of the forgiveness they're receiving from God, which actually they speak very little of. It's more of the forgiveness that they ought to show to to one another. So that's in the dynamic. Sometimes they also will view this as, Father, forgive them, and they will focus, uh, well, that was really just talking about the Roman soldiers, and they didn't really know what they were doing, so uh, focusing more on sins of ignorance. Mormons will sometimes make a distinction between, oh, I didn't know, God won't hold that against you. But what's so fascinating here is it's clear that sins of ignorance, if I'm flying down uh, the city street in 50 miles an hour and say to the police officer, um, hey, I didn't know the speed limit, it's still not going to play out well. I mean, <laughs> nice try, John. <laughs> it, it, you're still accountable. You still did wrong, whether you know it or not. And, and the Bible speaks of that, right? David saying, forgive my hidden faults. Um, Jesus even here saying that uh, sins of ignorance require forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, be careful about getting into a conversation about who's the them. Father, forgive them. Is it just the Roman soldiers? Here's what I would focus on. Take this in the section of culmination of all the Old Testament. All that ha- this has been leading up to, right? And, and the, the world has been waiting for a sacrifice for sin once for all. Hebrews talks about that. All the, old, the New Testament will point back to this moment, right? He's the atoning sacrifice for all sin, purifies us from all sin. And so uh, really emphasize it in, in that context. And then I think through eyes of faith, this comes to light in a new way. I love it every time bring, you can bring in Old Testament references into this because then that shows the context of all of Scripture testifying about Jesus and the atonement. One of the things that's so fascinating to me, I mean, he's not just forgiving the, the Roman soldiers. I, I think in the mix you can see um, the, the criminals who were hanging there nearby. Um, 
this is not conditional forgiveness. The, the soldiers didn't do anything, for example, that they would have deserved this. Mm-hmm. God yeah, they demo- got free forgiveness. <laughs> it's, it's free. It's no strings attached. And that's going to be a new concept because our LDS friends only understand and have been taught about conditional forgiveness. Uh, I love uh, Romans 5, 8 when trying to emphasize this, right? God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That, for many Mormons, has been uh, a stone in the shoe that they have a hard time shaking that God forgives, and he, these people didn't do anything to deserve that. So here's a follow-up question that I've been asked before, is if we are all forgiven, then what is the point of religion? You know, why does not everyone receive the benefit of forgiveness, et cetera? Right. Or uh, another way it can play out is if we're all just forgiven, then why don't we just have a license to sin and just, you know, yeah. shall gr- make grace Party. increase? <laughs> Uh, that Romans five, Paul. Uh, I'm sorry. Romans six, Paul addresses that. Is, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, right? We die to sin. It's not a license to sin. In effect, while Jesus died for the sin of the world, not all receive the benefit because not all believe. And I, here's a really fascinating way to maybe take a look at that. Uh, Hebrews gives us the picture. Hebrews ten. Uh, 17 and 18, that he will remember our sin no more, that there is true, full, complete forgiveness. And he says, in fact, there's no more place for you to bring a sacrifice, if you even tried, because it is so full and complete. But if you approach Jesus from a a perspective of Jesus plus, you're, you're trying to bring your sacrifice, then without maybe realizing it, you're saying to him, you are not enough. And you are... That, I mean, that is rejecting the gift that he made. It, it's, a, it's saying, I need to add to it. Thanks for what you brought, but it's not enough. And I, I can't imagine, honestly, on Judgment Day, trying to approach Jesus saying, well, what you did was not enough, so I had to add to it, because then you lose what he gave you. It reminds me, echoes of... Romans eleven six, where it talks about if it's by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. And that word grace is where the root word in the Greek, uh, we get gift. So you could almost read it that way. If it's a gift, then it's not by works. Otherwise, it could no longer be a gift. Uh, if, if you understand the gift of what Jesus had done for you, then you understand like when grandma gives you a gift, it's just an outright gift. You, there's nothing you have to do to earn it. Although, I suppose it might depend on the relationship you have with grandma. <laughs> if grandma is kind of, uh, let's say, manipulating or something like that, you have not like a toxic relationship with grandma, then maybe when she gives you a gift, you feel like compelled. Like, oh boy, now I have to do this or that in return. But if you understand, you just have a beautiful, unconditional love relationship with, with Grandma when she gives you a gift. You just accept it, and you see the, the fullness of, of what that gift is. Mm, truly understanding who Jesus is and who God is and how much that, how big that love is. I was just thinking about how um, LDS, for LDS, the gift is tiny because Jesus is just getting you to the courtroom. And when we can point back to Jesus being forsaken on the cross and suffering hell, no, look, he was judged for you. He has already received the punishment. The gift is huge. That's why Romans 8, there is now no condemnation, right? No more punishment can be met. It would be unjust for God to punish the same sin twice. And since he's already punished it on Jesus, it's not coming your way. All right. Um, what what section would you like to highlight next? You know, John uh, nineteen thirty, I think, is just such a beautiful one. If you happen to have that one handy. Okay. Uh, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, "It is finished." With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Okay, I just want to ask simple, basic questions about this. So, as a Christian, I'm just used to it. I'm already proclaiming this. This is my banner. It is finished but maybe I take it for granted. So first of all, tell me about the word it. (laughs) 
What is it? Well, it's a single Greek word, tetelestai, which uh, ultimately means it is accomplished, it, it is finished. Back in culture, it was used as a stamp, uh, for example, on invoices by merchants as paid in full. I think that gives some shade in the current usage uh, of the way it was that this, this is a payment so that full forgiveness, right? It echoes that. I think if you read it in the context of, again, the Old Testament, that he's the Passover lamb. This is happening on Passover weekend, right? Where all of this is taking place. He's the one who was perfect and the one who would ultimately be able to take away the sin of the world. And so when he says, to tell us die, paid in full, it is accomplished, it is finished, he's saying, not I am finished, as if he's, you know, tired and worn out. He's saying this in a victory of what he's won for us. And as a result, he's speaking of the gift he's now giving to us. So just making it the big gift it is. So I've had a conversation um, with a Mormon friend about this. And uh, you're always trying to show, look, sin is paid for. And he says, well, no, it is finished. Is just referring to, I'm done suffering. So he really diminished it and made it eh, just the last thing Jesus said before he died. Yeah, hey, I'm done suffering. More of an I am finished yeah, kind of a thing. Yeah. And, and it emphasized and said, no, no, this is, it is finished. And Jesus uh, saying, echo of uh, Barabbas. Now the guilty go free, right? You, you are rescued. Yeah, the Passover is finished. The atonement is finished. Forgiveness is complete. All that. I mean, there's so many things we can put before that and just dwell in all that finished means. And, and there's other things that are going, around, uh, going on at this time that help paint the picture of what he means when he says it is finished. I think in particular of Matthew 27. All right. Is this, uh, yeah, when the curtain tears, this is uh, verse 51 and following. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out, the t out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. This doesn't sound like Jesus is just like, yay, I'm done suffering. Sounds like it's a big deal, John. <laughs> yeah, like the dead raised, right? The, the, the earth, the creation is reacting in this moment. One of the things I think that what does the it mean and it is finished? Uh, our LDS friends will understand that Jesus will, through his resurrection, end up uh, conquering death. So the idea that you have people coming back to life, they would uh, perhaps acknowledge uh, the, the power of the resurrection over death. But you and I know that it's not just power over death. And, and the part in particular I would focus on is verse 51, where it talks about the curtain of the temple being torn in two. Uh, up until this point, the, the curtain temple was a separation with God. It was always the... Uh, quarantine back room right god because of he's a holy god and and because of our sin he though he wanted to dwell with us he he was unable to and that it blocked off the holy place right right where god dwelled the presence of god and wasn't there the threat of death if you went behind that curtain absolutely instantly in fact the only person who could go in there was the uh, high priest on one day a year the the great day of atonement and uh, first of all, he'd sprinkle blood on the uh, mercy seat, the atonement cover of the Ark of the Covenant, first for himself, and then, then he could do that for, for the people. Uh, there was such fear and terror involved that uh, uh, we're, we're told in other resources that they would tie a rope around his foot so that in the event that he, uh, this didn't go well for him, he could um, be pulled out oh. from <laughs> behind the curtain because you wouldn't want to, to go fetch him. Um, so you can appreciate the, the fear, the trepidation. The people knew basically this curtain was a keep out sign. Oh, interesting. Well, and I remember this from another resource. Uh, there's a, a children's book, book called The Garden, the Temple, and the Curtain. And they do a beautiful job of connecting this curtain to the Garden of Eden. So on the curtain is embroidered, embroidered cherubs. And if you can remember back to the Garden of Eden, just after Adam and Eve sinned, they were kicked out of the garden. And what was guarding it? Cherubs. 
the keep out sign from the Garden of Eden. Uh, access to God denied. And then the curtain, access to God denied. And then, oh, it was torn from top to bottom. That's interesting. Top to bottom. Uh, this is no small curtain to tear. I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, sometimes people might uh, tear a muscle shirt or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's very thin fabric or something like, like, uh, <laughs> incredible Hulk kind of stuff. But uh, it, g- this was a four-inch curtain. I'm trying to think of like a four-inch piece four of... Four inches thick. Thick yeah. piece of fabric to, to try and... T- and it, this would go up, you know, incredibly high. So to be torn from top to bottom, it was clear that this was an act of God himself. The moment that Jesus dies, this now happens. It gives us indication to what he meant when he said, It is finished. Up until that point, God could not dwell with his people. He wanted to. He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He came down at Mount Sinai, though Ten Commandments and the people couldn't keep their parts, so he had to stay in the back room. Uh, Pillar of fire by uh, night, pillar of cloud by day. He wanted to dwell with his people, but, but there's always the separation. And the moment that it is finished, sin is paid for, The sacrifice that everything had been pointing to had happened. Now the barrier of sin had been removed, and so did the curtain. And now God, who who so longed to dwell with his people, now dwells so closely with us that he calls us his temple. He dwells within us. Okay, so how is this going to look with witnessing? Because I know temples are a big deal in Mormonism. Uh, on, you know, how much do I need to know about their view of the t- their temples and what they believe about this text? He does not dwell in temples built by human hands, though I would say be careful as you address that. Uh, this scripture, of course, but they might not be in the space for that because they take great pride in their temples. And you don't want to necessarily mm-hmm. poke them in the eye. But what I would really focus on more positively is this idea that I don't have to go to a certain place in order to receive God's presence because Corinthians talks about how he has now made us his temple. And that was all possible. That all happened the moment we see that the temple was torn, curtain was torn in two. Now his presence can dwell within us. So this is my opportunity to really explain why I, as a biblical Christian, don't have a temple anymore is because the, the ne- necessity of it has been abolished. It, everything has been fulfilled. I have access to God right now. What's so fascinating to me is the even Orthodox Judaism cannot uh, recreate the, the temple in, in the same way because there are certain factors that they would need uh, in order to dedicate that God has not allowed to happen. And so it's very, very clear that um, all of this was fulfilled. There's no more need for temples um, after this moment. Is there anything else from this section you would highlight? Again, I would emphasize that you have direct access to God. Mm -hmm. So often in Mormonism, it's through a hierarchy, uh, through the institution of the church, and it's kind of a middle man that you have to go through in order to access God, and and you have to follow uh, the certain requirements that they set out for you. Uh, Emphasize how you now have direct access access to God. Your church is your community, but it's not the way through which um, you then gain access to God. You already have it through Jesus. So can I bring up a verse that I have used that didn't go well um, in witnessing? So when Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise, this is Luke 23, verse 43, and he is speaking to uh, one of the thieves on on the cross next to him. You know, he looks like Jesus forgives him. And now when you die today, you're going to be in heaven. And I tried to show this morning I was speaking with, like, look, he received all of it on that day. Um, (laughs) You want to explain why it didn't go well? I bet you know. Yeah, uh, this is a, a difficult section to talk through with our LDS friends. We would want to emphasize like you did, hey, you know what? He didn't do anything. In fact, he was part of the mocking ahead of time. Yeah. It said both of the criminals uh, were mocking. Um, later, he, he, he turns around. They would say, um, they might highlight to, to his turnaround and repentance. They might highlight um, 
this part of the Bible was mistranslated, so really he just goes to a spirit prison. But even if they uh, believe uh, it as it is written, today you'll be with me in paradise, they have a very distinct meaning for that term paradise. They would believe that when you become a, a faithful Mormon, when you check the box, has done all that's necessary, that you go to a spirit world, not spirit prison, but in the spirit world, a place called paradise. Mm -hmm. And they would then emphasize that a missionary force goes down in the spirit world, a, a place after this life to, to reach those still in spirit prison. So because there's so much baggage associated with this term paradise, I probably wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. I don't want you as a, a Christian witness to, to at all uh, miss what's happening here. I, I think we understand this mm -hmm. as a picture of heaven with good reason, Revelation 2, 7, in the context of God living with his people in heaven describes the tree of life being in paradise. Hmm. But probably not a okay. place I'm going to So focus. it could be an interesting discussion about how I believe paradise is a different, yeah. has a different definition, but it could lead down a rabbit hole that isn't productive. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so yes, give us a summary overall. Um, what are we focusing on and the whys? So often, uh, it people don't maybe want to look at the cross. I think even those who aren't Mormon will shy away from it because they, they don't want to see the full gravity of sin. But if you understand really what's happening here, you don't have to avoid it. Then you embrace the cross in a whole new way, just like ex-Mormon Christians who then wear the cross boldly because they understand the prominence. So don't sh shy away. Point to the gravity. The cross reflects punishment, hell even itself, that we deserved. Mormons are going to talk about, well, we want to focus more on a living Jesus, but you're going to get to that. But help them say, I want to focus on uh, the glory of that living Jesus, but in order to really see that in all of its fullness, I need to see the depths to which he was willing to go first and why, why it was necessary. Remind them to approach Calvary with the right set of lenses. It's not just a show of love. It is that, but not just Jesus' example. Approach this with a set of lenses. And I would encourage you to, to ask them to read this through the lens of Jesus as their substitute and see if the Spirit doesn't open their eyes in entirely new ways. Focus not just on what happens here at Calvary, but especially on why. We see in this section there was an exchange, the uh, Barabbas, right? The, the guilty goes free. The innocent is punished. He doesn't just speak of forgiving others. He shows forgiveness. And then the proof behind it when he says it is finished, full forgiveness, unconditional. The work is complete. Nothing more to add. And that gives us direct access to God now and forever. forever. I sometimes think about it this way. Uh, I know next week we'll be talking about the resurrection. Here's the way I, I pair Calvary and the empty tomb. If Calvary closes the gates of hell, then the empty tomb opens the gates of heaven. Really emphasize how he took the punishment for us so that we never would have to. This is exciting. I'm so excited for you Christians and praying that God opens the doors of opportunity and uh, it probably feels like a, a heavy responsibility, but don't be afraid. Just talk about the Jesus you know. Will you pray for our witnessing friends? Yeah, absolutely. King Jesus, uh, first of all, you sit on the throne of our hearts. We, we marvel that you went to these lengths, not only to show your love, to, but to be that rescue plan, that sacrifice that we needed. Help us by your spirit, first of all, to stand in the, the, the full forgiveness of all that that means, knowing exactly where we stand, that there is now no condemnation. And then let that just overflow through us onto others uh, as we have opportunity in this unique moment where our LDS friends are actually studying about Calvary, about the cross, work powerfully through our Christian witnesses so that, so that many more might see this through a whole new lens, might see it, you as the, 
as the king that they needed, the one who was willing to take the punishment and, and not just what happened, but why it matters. Uh, Father, we ask that you would send the Spirit and work powerfully in the hearts of those who hear this so that they might see Jesus in a whole new light. We pray it all in his name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, John. Go give him heaven. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth and love ministry podcast. For more resources, visit tilm.org. If this podcast and other truth and love ministry resources have been a blessing to you, consider supporting the mission to proclaim Christ to Mormons and empower Christians to witness by visiting tilm.org backslash 